Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. It's been a memorable week in the world and we have a memorable programme to match. Later in the programme, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General. And wherever you're watching this program, there's a sporting chance he'll be talking about your part of the world, among others. Then there's General Martin Luther Agwai. He's the force commander of the UNAU mission in Darfur. And there's rock superstar Brian Adams, too. But first, the new Cold War. Or is it? Forty days after the end of hostilities in Georgia's breakaway republics of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, an uncertain ceasefire sort of holds. Russia has recognized the new republics, but the West insists that they're still a part of Georgia. So what next? Well, I'm delighted to be joined from Tbilisi by the president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili. Mr. President, we thank you very much indeed for joining us. A general question first triggered off Very honored to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. A first general question, um, the events of the last month and so on. Um, do you think we are possibly the world, the region, on the verge of a new Cold War? Well, I believe that uh, Russia does not have resources to have, uh, get into a Cold War because Cold War was ba basically meant existing of two parallel worlds that were self-efficient, self-sufficient, were not really dependent upon each other. Russia is so dependent upon uh, whatever the rest of the international community has to say about them or indeed do about them. And this has been shown by recent economic events in Russia that I don't think I, they can afford one. However, the way they are behaving exceeds far uh, whatever the Soviet leaders have been doing at least uh, since death of Joseph Stalin. And that's, that's precarious. And certainly for my region, for my country, but for the neighborhood around Russia, this situation does look mild, you know, less dangerous than it was during the Cold War. Right. Less or more dangerous? I think it looks more dangerous right now. It was more, predi more predictable, more, um, more predictably unpredictable right now. In Cold War, at least, there were some kind of, well, not so good, such good rules, but at least some predictability in terms of even those bad rules. Now, there is, it's game without rules right now in this neighborhood. And in terms of this neighborhood, um, do you think, do you still hold any hope after recent events that South Ossetia and Abkhazia may rejoin uh, Georgia in full? I'm sure, I'm totally convinced, but that's, that's you know, what happened here is, uh, what is happening in mean, the making here is uh, such an obnoxious defiance of international law and order, such an unparalleled thing that I don't think that can, anybody can get away with this in 21st century. This is a very irregular situation, very troublesome, but because it's so irregular and because it's so obnoxious, there is no way it can be, ever become sustainable. Well, of course, but this, I think this is just a challenge not only to us, but I think it's a challenge to the international community, to, uh, the, or to the international law. So I think uh, it's much wider than Georgia right now, and I think there will be, this will not be left as it is. I mean, nobody is going to yeah, recognize the status quo, and certainly I think we'll be working together with our partners to reverse and then to roll, roll it back. So. Uh, if, we, if you can change the current status quo, that will have to be, will that have to be done with words or will it have to be done militarily? Well, look what happened to the Russian market. The Russian market went to hell. I mean, the country's leaders are proclaiming that, you know, their economy is fit, but their stock, stock market is closed uh, for third day in a row. The, it is really collapse of economy. And you know, this, I think, partly it's influenced by world market, but partly uh, the upheavals in world market. But this kind of catastrophe certainly is the direct result of aggression into Georgia and uh, the irregularity that it has created. <coughs> it's not, I'm not, don't, we don't take credit for it in entirety, but the irregularity, the, the violation of rules and the uh, you know, sense of insecurity it has created has been tremendous. And what I mean is that they, of course, that these are, does it, was it caused by words? I think it was complex factors. It's about economy, it's about Russia's role in the world, it's about international law applied, it's about consequences, because Russia has violated law to the extent where Every, anybody else that had done it in the past has faced severe consequences. So 
what form it will take, it's too early to say. I mean, there are already the results, the repercussions are all there, and I think it's only the start of what might happen. And in terms of what might, what might happen next and so on, um, they would have to unrecognize uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, wouldn't they, in order to bring peace between your two they, countries? They will have to regularize, regularize situation. They will have, will have to bring situation back to regular, to, uh, you know, legal framework. And of course, that also involves that Russia should become much more normal in its behavior and not act like an insecure, isolated, authoritarian, rogue government. And so that's exactly what is the, you know, the perception right now for many people that are interacting with Russia. And certainly, in this way, you know, they've, they've, what they've tried to do is that they said this is the new world order as we've done it. I mean, of course, it's not a world, it's not new world order, it's not even new world disorder. It is a major disorder, but it's not the world disorder. I think what will happen, that world will try to regularize it together with us. The neighborhood here will try to regularize it. I think many countries, not only the European Union, but China, <coughs> the U.S., but other countries in the neighborhood are playing very positive roles. Wider Middle East is very involved and interested. So I think all of this will uh, eventually result into them regularizing. You know, these are, this, this is no longer Stalin's times when he just attacked Finland and seized part of these territories. And this is not, uh, you know, you know, Nazi Germany seizing part of Czechoslovakia and then seizing most of Europe. I think we are living in 21st century. Generals, soldiers that went march through our streets from Russia, they had exactly the same habits which I, we've known from our books from 19th, 18th century, 20th century. But we are living to 21st century. When they march into Georgia in the 19th century or in early 20th century, stock market didn't exist back then. We didn't have, um, uh, you know, uh, Al Jazeera or CNN around and all other <laughs> things. So the world has changed. And yes. I think, uh, I think also unfortunate technologies have changed, but that's where we are. And, uh, and what, what about the people who say that uh, in terms of, of your response to the events, that on August the 7th and 8th there was a disproportionality about the scale of, of your response in terms of shells and rockets and uh, the bombing of civilians. Look, look. Um, do you think your there response was, was disproportionate? Yeah. There was a brilliant survey done, first of all, by Human Rights Watch that clearly indicated that none of the events that, as Russia was describing, genocide or mass killing of civilians, none of this ever closely took place from the Georgian side. We respond to Russian invasion and fire. Certainly, people died, and the absolute majority of the military and militias. I regret any death, including those of military. However, there was a very good in journalistic inquiry done by New York Times a couple of days ago, which clearly proved and there is an incontrovertible evidence. And it was then repeated by the European newspapers, by Washington Post, and by the others, clearly showing, and today it was also on the world networks, that Russia has invaded large Georgia large scale first, and then Georgia responded. Now look, we and Russia have historic, natural, beautiful border. These are Caucasian mountains. They are 5,500 meters high. This is a very nice natural border. That has been our border since thousands of years. I mean, Georgia, Russia had been around for a thousand years, Georgia for 2,000, but okay, since they are around, it had been our border. But unfortunately, these mountains were not designed to stop Russian airplanes, especially the strategic bombers with which they flew in. And of course, they invaded. They invaded with planes, with tanks. They went through this um, uh, tunnel. And as one of my, my Western friends told me, I said, see, you know, there is a final proof in Western press that Russians invade first. He said, I didn't need this proof, you know. I know that tanks don't fly over mountains and they would not be there in a couple of hours time as Russians do claim it. They were there much before. It was a premeditated invasion and certainly uh, it was a classical case of invading, taking over and annexing parts of your neighbor, of another independent country. And cannot, they certainly will not and should not get away with this. Did you, do you think you underestimated the scale of the Russian army's reaction or do you, did you overestimate the scale of Western support for Georgia, did that disappoint you? Look, the main thing where we really needed Western support was to avoid it. For many months before this had happened, indeed for years, I've been telling many leaders 
in the West and not only in the West, that that might, be, might happen. And also Russia was making noises. And you know, President Putin promised me two years ago he would make a Northern Cyprus for me. But it looks like now when I talk to other leaders in the world, he has also told them that he would make Northern Cyprus for Georgia. So there was nothing new. There was a Russian military buildup for months and months before it had happened. We've been turned, warning everybody about that. So where we would really be efficient would be to avoid it jointly. Now, the problem was that even us, who were of course very much focused on this danger, couldn't till the end believe that it was 100% real. Even we subconsciously tried, tried to downplay it. Because until now, the perception consensus was that nothing like this could have ever had happened on the part of Russia here. And that was, I guess, most of the decision makers in other countries were thinking. Well, overestimating Russian front, once Russia decided to cross red lines, of course, no mountains and no Georgian troops could have uh, contained them for too long, although I have to tell you that our troops fought very bravely in very, very inequal, inequal circumstances. Uh, but the, and the, that's what really helped us to save the capital and to save basically the core of Georgian statehood because when Russians came in, they didn't come for those territories. They, had, they were in factual control of those territories in the past as well. They basically seized control of a few more villages, but they wanted to control energy resources from Central Asia and Caspian, and they wanted to get rid of the government of Georgia. None of that had happened, and I think this was a combination of a bravery of our troops, of uh, mobilization of the government, of mobilization of people behind the government, and strong international reaction. So the reaction was strong on the part of the European Union, on the part of other actors here, and I think that really helped to deter some of the worst uh, goals uh, by, by Russia. But, you know, of course, uh, you know, the situation is still precarious, and they still pre continue to occupy South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which, of course, is totally unacceptable from any point of view. And do you think that, uh, Mr. President, do you think that uh, the events of the last month will affect your joining NATO, will make it more difficult? Well, I think joining NATO for us has not been coming up purely military thing, or uh, indeed has been less of a military thing. It was part of becoming a bigger alliance. Georgia has always been aspiring historically, and it's a very ancient nation, to become part of something bigger, something bigger than them, something more important, and to be contributed to this something bigger. And from that point of view, I, I believe uh, this, this goal is, stays there. We just have North Atlantic, we just had North Atlantic, Atlantic Council. This is the chief policy-making body in NATO visiting for the first visit Georgia. They've set for the first time NATO-Georgian Commission, and I think that will be an important framework. And ultimately, this is a political decision. And this will be played out in uh, several big NATO member countries because we have support of all the others. Um, I think it will be, be it's, it's a very important part of internal German political discussion. I think it will be part of French political discussion. But obviously, there are two ways of, to uh, approach it. The one way is to say, okay, well, once Georgia meets all the standards, it should be in. Uh, or the other one to say, or well, there are spheres of influence, and Russia is entitled to have their own spheres of influence. But one thing should be known. First of all, nobody is entitled to spheres of influence. And that, then, in real terms, Russia is not a real superpower. R Russia's economy is in bad shape. We've seen their army here. They are not in good shape. They are not the, certainly the army they once used to have in Soviet times. They are much worse shaping. And, and generally, this is still a very fragile and insecure country. They have still a long way to go. So I don't think they would rather solve their own issues rather than meddle in abroad and try to claim that they have natural spheres of influence. And uh, have you, since April the 7th or 8th, had, had any direct uh, contact with, with the Kremlin at all? I mean, are you planning a candlelit dinner with Mr. Putin or something? Uh -huh. All my attempts to reach them before it had happened, because things have been escalated for quite a while, failed. And certainly after that, I've tried to resume contacts. It did, did work. Um, presidency of Russia, I mean, I say collective presidency because it's not really clear who really, I mean, I think it's pretty clear who really makes decisions there, uh, has uh, called me um, uh, continuously a, a political corpse. Uh, so, you know, I guess uh, they, they don't have real, 
uh, incentive to talk with the corps, but this, uh, I mean, I still sit here, talk to you, uh, so uh, I'm not quite a corpse yet, at least politically, for sure. And uh, I think this was a very big sign of weakness to refuse to have dialogue, to refuse to reach out, to refuse to listen to the other points of view, to refuse to, uh, you know, get engaged. I think that's, you know, the fact that they would enjoy to sit at table with leaders of South Ossetia, where the whole population here now is there less than 10,000 people, and with so-called leader of Abkhazia that had expelled in the 90s 500,000 people from there and less than 80 stay, including the only less than 50,000 ethnic Abkhaz. You are a leader of big country, Russia, and you enjoy sitting with these people here, being isolated by all other big powers. Does it look serious? No, it doesn't, from my point of view. So I don't think I mean, the things that are, they've been doing are pretty surreal, and I don't think they are productive for Russia in any long term or in, even in short term. Mr. President, uh, you are very clearly not a corpse. In fact, I think your English is probably rather more articulate than mine. We, th we thank you very much for, for being <laughs> with us. Thank Thanks. you so much. I look forward well, to I've talking again. I've been a long again. time admirer of you. And thank, you for, thank you for inviting me. That's an honor. Thank Goodbye. you very much indeed. Godspeed. Later on, the Secretary General of the UN, but after the break, General Martin Luther Agwai. He's the force commander of the UN African Union mission in Darfur. Join us then.